Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the July edition of the Cornerstone Critical Dialogues. My name is Shakira Dramat, and I am the Critical Dialogue Coordinator. I have been asked to introduce our wonderful facilitator this evening, who is also on screen with me, Tulani. Say hello to the people. Hi, Shakira. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone at home. Hi. <laughs> Hi, um, so I will be introducing Tulani and Tulani will then take over and introduce you to the rest of the panelists and also facilitate our discussion as well as do a little bit of an introduction of what we will be talking about this evening. Uh, so Tulani is the Cornerstone Programs Coordinator and also Business Studies Lecturer. He holds a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Nicosia. He graduated with an Honours Bachelor of Commerce in Business Management from the University of South Africa, where he also received a Bachelor of Commerce degree in Human Resources. Um, his passion for human capital development further urged him towards a higher national certificate in skills development facilitation through UNISA as well. Uh, Tulani's lecturing focus areas include leadership development, entrepreneurship and business management. He remains committed to focusing on managerial leadership development, as well as youth empowerment and development through various platforms. All of this makes Tulan the perfect person to facilitate this evening's discussion. And with that, I leave the rest to you, Tulan. Thanks, Shakira. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the comfort of your homes. Um, I would like to just uh, take this time and just uh, thank the Cornerstone team that works behind the scene to, to put this together, to say thank you for that. Um, to, to, the, to, to everyone at home, we would like to make this as interactive as possible. So in, uh, if you can comment uh, uh, on posts you like, uh, you like them, the comment on, uh, on inputs that you, you don't like, we'd like to keep this as, as interactive as, as possible. The, um, the objective of, of, of tonight's um, discussion is, is to uncover um, the evolution of education and uh, workforce requirements, especially with the rapid changes that the pandemic has brought on us. This discussion will also take into consideration the socioeconomic climate um, on the South African, uh, within the South African context. Uh, the, the topic, as, as, um, as many of you have, have seen, uh, it's been circulating, reimagining re education and workforce requirements for a 21st century Africa. Tonight, um, tonight, our panel has been drawn from two focal areas. They bring with them lived, researched, as well as practical insights into the discussion. This uh, panel is representative of different segments with respect to economic input, as well as socio-demographic factors, and will delve into the intersection of education, into the, uh, the intersection of the education system with the current and future workforce within the South African context. With the current pandemic forcing unimaginable changes and ripple effects across various sectors at a global scale, the education sector and the future of work cannot have gone unscathed. This discussion aims to drive further discussions on the appropriateness um, of higher education curriculum and infrastructure at a broad level in addressing the requirements of the rapidly changing, rapidly evolving workforce, as well as the prerequisite graduate attributes to drive socioeconomic growth in South Africa and throughout Africa as a whole. While there are a number of factors contributing to socioeconomic growth in Africa as a whole, I trust that this discussion will touch on issues such as the question whether there is need for a centralization of academic processes, as well as a centralized approach in institutionalizing upskilling of the future workforce. Can past, South Afri can past African stories help in the creation of sustainable development strategies? Are the current revised teaching and learning methodologies adequate to empower the youth in the current climate and prepare them for an unknown future, considering the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought and how institutions must evolve because of it? 
leadership development, innovation, transformation, digitization. These are some words that have been whispered, but in a sense seems to be concepts of the future. The pandemic has shown that the future needs to be now. In the last couple of months, Africa has seen increased digitization and a faster pace of technological implementation in academic and work environments. The broader question we should perhaps be asking ourselves is what it really means for the socioeconomic prosperity of Africa. As we embrace the new reality, we have to reassess or reimagine how we invest in our educational systems as as well as business structures. Must there be a mindset shift from employment to job creation? If yes, how do academic institutions reimagine this future or mindset, sh or mindset shift? Tonight's panelists will help drive that, that conversation. Um, my first panelist that I would like to, to, to introduce to, 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 to have um, opening remarks on this is no stranger to business transformation, Mr. Mkondisi Gumete. Mkondisi, Mkondisi is the founder and CEO of the OMG, a customer success company whose aim is to assist clients with accelerated growth. He's a keynote speaker and a knowledge merchant at IC Knowledge Bureau, which is intent of being a driver of exponentiality. Nkondisi has completed projects in a number of consulting and advisory cap capacities for various companies with the national and global footprints, such as KPMG, Momentum, Coca-Cola, just, just to mention a few. Um, with that being said, um, Nkondisi, I'd like to, to give you the stage. Good evening, Tulani. Thank you so much for um, I'm, I'm suspicious that you invited me only to see if I could have opening remarks that are within the time frame, three to five minutes. I think that this is probably why I'm an ardent. I think in the run up to this, Tulani had said he'd never seen me present short opening remarks, and so they end on the evening. So if you'll set your watches very, very slowly and make sure that they only take a half pace, I'll be able to get through the opening remarks. I think it's an important discussion, and I think it's such a great topic to be um, engaged in this evening for a number of reasons. I think that the thing that academia has been principally supporting have been shaken in the past couple of weeks. Um, we know that we've relied on educational institutions to enable us to enter the world of work and to be successful in there. And also, on another dimension of that system, we've looked at it, for people to be able to build sustainable communities and societies. And so it is with that in mind that I think I would like to um, present my opening remarks. And I like to think about this and think about the work that I'm doing in history and other things at the moment, is that I like to think of the reimagining of education akin to a naval a naval exercise. If you think about it, imagine that you're an admiral of a navy and you had to try and successfully sail from one destination to another. If that was the case, you immediately be confronted with the fact that there are three dimensions that you're dealing with. The first would be you'd need to have very capable single ships that make up this armada or this navy that you're in command of. If the ships that are individually um, are constituent of the navy are unsound, they would just um, impede other ships, sink for no reason, they wouldn't be able to make it to the destination. The second aspect would be that only with these individual ships be found, one of the things that they would need to accept for that is to have coordinated um, um, abilities so that they can work with the ships around them in order to execute the command and to be able to sail safely to the destination. Finally, if you're a good admiral, history tells us that you never find yourself not going to the right destination that, um, you know, for the battle or for the war that you're engaged in. And so you, what you find is that you've got this idea where the individual ship needs to be sound, needs to be able to take care of itself, 
but it also needs to be able to be coordinated with others. And also you need to be able to get to, um, you need to be able to get to the destination. And that analogy is great for me because it presents three levels, I think, which this um, education conversation needs to be taking place. How is it that we um, enable the people that arrive at our institutions of higher education? How do we teach people not only to have a skill that allows them to be a contributing member of society, but also how they can do that successfully in coordination with other people? And also how we can do that while making sure that we contribute to a societal goal. So I think that these three aspects are one of the ways in which I think we should be looking at the education question along those three dimensions. Um, I think um, we'll get into a little later why I think those three levels are important. But I thought that one other consideration would be a good way to open up the conversation. And that is the principle of the fact that whenever we look at something like this, there's been a real endowment. Some you know, previous generations have really bequeathed something of value to us. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to kind of understand what is core and where it is that we can stimulate the progress. So I don't think that it is an easy conversation to have because you can't just throw everything out because there are things of great utility that have lasted throughout time and have come down through the ages. And there's some educational truths that remain in the system because you can see that they've been useful for so long. I think what this generation needs to do is to understand how we can stimulate progress in keeping what's core, but also injecting the innovation and the freshness to serve not only the economic needs that we have right now, but also the broader society in which the economic activity takes place. And so I thought that these were the only two points that I could fit into the challenge that was laid down by Tulani, and I hope to expand on these in a little while. At that is over three minutes. As I had said, you never keep it short. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, um, as I move on to, to introduce our second panelist, um, you touched on, on an issue of, of academia being able to, to change and not change at the same time. And I think um, our next panelist will, will, is well positioned for that, having come into to, to the academic space and is now currently uh, working at, at our institution. Um, so I'm going to take, take some time just to introduce Nicola Cupido, um, who originally hails from a small town of Robertson. She's a Cornerstone alumni and holds an undergrad degree in psychology. Um, I've, I've seen her in the halls of Cornerstone now and again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she currently works at Cornerstone, where she deals with new admissions in the registrar's office. Um, and I think you're well positioned to kind of explain part of your journey and also how you advise students going forward. So I'll give you time for your opening remarks as well. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, Tulani. Thank you for having me. So I feel that Oh, I feel like so basically I come from a background which is low socioeconomic status and to a environment where I was provided with dignity and exposure. To a private education. Um, Nicola, I think you're you're not. Um, I'm losing you for a second. Education. Can you can you hear me? So. Hello. That has given me a platform where I could see more and I was exposed to more. Um, I feel like that is looking 
at our current um, situation with the pandemic, it has actually highlighted for me personally, it's highlighted the difference between um, the, 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 the has and the don't have. Because my background, I can say that if I did not have access to private um, tertiary education, I probably would not have been in the position that I am in right now. So with that said, I feel like it's sorry. Hi, Nicola, I think we're losing you. Um, hi, sorry about that, everyone at home. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring on um, Lance, Lance August uh, as our next panelist while we, we, we sort out the, the technical glitch with, with Nicola. Um, Lance, I think, is very well positioned. The, the reason, just, just to, to give context to everyone as, at home, the, the reason we, we, we wanted Lance and Nicola in this conversation as well is because with, with Nicola, we have some uh, from a private institution private high institution, and that comes with its own um, perceptions. And with Lance, um, Lance is a, is, is a graduate of drama and media and writing from the University of Cape Town. Uh, so that's coming from a, a uh, dare I say, it, a previously advantaged institution. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and is currently, um, an honors candidate um, in applied theater and performance. Um, Lance works in student, student government, governance and leadership at the university and has been tasked with reimagining what student leadership looks like, which I think is really great um, in, an, in, in an age of, of pandemic. Um, Lance oversees the residence committees works with faculty councils and sits on the SRC at, uh, at UCT. Hans, uh, over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Tolani. Um, so when, when I think of a 21st century Africa, I can't help but think of all the challenges that, that we are facing as a continent. I read an article a few weeks ago that was written by um, Zahra Ben Semra, an opportunity that, that Af as a whole has to address these challenges, particularly because uh, Africa has um, a young population average in terms of, in terms of age. Um, and I suspect that might be due to the life expectancy of African countries. But anyway, some of the challenges we face are the slow acceleration in the digital space, you know, young researchers penetrating artificial intelligence, um, genomics, um, 3D printing automation, and the robotic spaces. And then, of course, another another challenge is the inadequacies at the governance level. Um, uh, I read somewhere that 54% of Africa's youth is unemployed. And there's an idea that exists that the increase uh, in government programs which promote youth development could be a means to flatten the, the unemployment curve. Um, I think that as young Africans, we have been, uh, we have an, we have enormous potential to be to be part of and expand Africa's productive workplace. I think that we are able to um, contribute to job creation. We can, can encourage entrepreneurship, and we can make use of the physical wealth or resources that that our continent has. But I, I feel like the key to is reimagining education in all levels, primary through to, ter um, through to tertiary, uh, ultimately um, producing graduates who are able to respond to the challenges that I mentioned. But this will only be possible, I think, that if governments do more to increase the throughput for, of children from primary through to tertiary, and also if education is reimagined so that children in schools and uh, students at colleges and universities are prepared for the workspace. Um, just to bring this back to the South African context slightly during the COVID-19 pandemic, I have been pulled into to various working groups at the University of Cape Town who looked specifically at reimagining education to fit the context of a pandemic. And this was mainly in the postgraduate space that I contributed. 
but also in the assessment space where the university is looking at adapting the assessment framework to serve hybrid contexts, if that makes sense. Um, then, of course, all of this reimagination needs to take into account uh, the student experience. And, and this is NC remote learning. Uh, uh, that looks at making uh, emergency remote learning um, a seamless experience for students. But now through all of this, I've observed that universities have quite a bit of work to do in terms of preparing uh, students for the requirements of the working world or the workforce. Um, I, I I can't speak for TVET colleges and I can't speak for the, the University of Technology sector though, because my understanding uh, uh, is entirely um, that those type of institutions provide for things like internships and apprenticeships and things like that. And that equips those um, students from those institutions for some form of workplace readiness. But in the traditional university space, if I can call it that, um, I don't think that students are necessarily meeting uh, um, uh, workforce requirements. Perhaps, yes, uh, students who are studying degrees that are accountable to accreditation bodies like the LLB, Bachelor of Social Work, uh, engineering degrees, accounting degrees, and things like that. Um, uh, um, I think that, but generally, uh, education needs to be reimagined and enhanced to allow for workforce readiness. Um, my start though is that alongside its skills readiness students must be provided with opportunities to practice and um in and units at our universities are doing enough by providing opportunities for student governance and leadership whether it be in resident spaces faculty spaces or in societies and student organizations um thanks to Lani. Unmute. There we go. Thanks, Lance. Um, you you really came out swinging, and you tackled a, a lot of a lot of points on on that. There's there's an interesting one. Um, just just before I introduce the the, the next panelist, um, one of the issues of digitization and um, uh, and 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 we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and uh, building a workforce. And, and I'd like all the panelists just to, to think about this because I had a discussion with someone earlier about it and, and, and they gave me a very interesting analogy is as we are, as we are preparing for a, a 21st century Africa workforce, it means we are reimagining uh, training uh, or equipping people, graduates with, with those skills. Uh, so essentially, what this will do is help cut youth and youth unemployment. That's that's the the objective. Uh, however, it's it's an interesting question. What happens to the workforce that's already in there but without the skills? And something very interesting. We always say we repurpose or retrain. Interesting analogy from from a conversation I had today. When someone says, "If because you're no longer using that, when you pull it out, chances are you want to keep going." You know, so someone said to me, when you have a puncture and you change your wheel, you put it in the boot, you continue on your way. Chances are you, will, you won't stop somewhere to get it mended. And, you know, it, it breaks up the flow of things. But that's just for, for everyone to think of. And thank you for, thank you for, that, uh, for those opening remarks. Um, that being said, I'll, I'd like to, to call someone on who's, who's pretty much straddled um, I'd like to say straddled both 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 worlds of of um, of work and and education because of 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 the role she has and or the role she's played uh, and what she's been doing in in that space. Um, Shalene Duncan. Shalene is uh, the director for the Center of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Western Cape. Um, the um, this hub is active in developing short courses and entrepreneurship training programs across seven faculties at uh, at UWC. Its objective is addressing the student 
entrepreneurship agenda, which I'm hoping somewhere along the line you'll, you'll break it down to us what exactly that is, Shalene. Um, Ms. Duncan has uh, developed a global network for the Center of Entrepreneurship uh, on the African continent, USA, and, and, um, and across Europe. She is the she is the convener of the Community of Practice, the Entrepreneurial University for the national platform representing 26 South African universities. Um, Shalene also serves as chairperson of the board of directors at Community Chest, a nonprofit organization based in the Western Cape. Shalene, over to you. Thank you, Tulani, and thank you, Paul. Um, I think it's great because in this chapter we were talking about reimagining um, and that we're not talking about how we're going to be repairing. It's, it's, it's so imperative that we're given the space to think um, across various sectors and of, across various areas about, about education and about the workforce for the 21st century. Um, I don't think I want to spend too much time going into the unemployment challenges in our country, but I, I just want to highlight the fact that our youth unemployment rate is, is very high. Um, it's about 55% at the moment. Um, I also want to just touch on the fact that graduate employability is a huge problem um, and that graduates are struggling um, even more than youth who have not been um, to, to a university. I think that's something that we must, we must just keep in the back of our minds. Um, COVID-19 has exposed so many things um, and I want to say that higher education has been in trouble a long time um, prior to, to COVID-19. COVID-19 is just once again exposed all the fault lines and it's also just highlighted once again once again that um, it's a shared global condition it's not something that we um, are experiencing on our continent alone I think one of the other panelists has already mentioned the fact that we need to be looking at university students in terms of how do we prepare students to become job creators um, because we know from a job seeking perspective the unemployment rate is quite high um, I believe that is an entrepreneurial revolution happening um, in South Africa right now. Every South African, in my opinion, every South African student has the potential to be an entrepreneur. And how do we harness that? How do we harness that student entrepreneurship that exists? So I'm also mindful about the fact that I can talk a lot and that I get quite carried away when I get into something that I'm quite passionate about. And what I'd like to talk about this evening, I'm just going to, to mention and highlight some of the points, which I think is quite important. The one thing that I want to talk about is the entrepreneurial mindset. I believe that when we look at education and when we look at how we need to reimagine education, we need to look at a competency-based model of learning. And I'm not going to go into that right now. I just want to, to mention some of the highlights I want to talk about. I'm also going to talk about the development of an entrepreneurial mindset and why such a mindset is so important for every student, irrespective of whether the student goes on to become an entrepreneur or not. Those, um, on that skill that an ent uh, entrepreneurial mindset has, you can use in any sector that you're going to be finding yourself in. I also want to touch on um, entrepreneurial university and the role of the entrepreneurial uni university, particularly at the time where um, we need to start looking at the model, um, what are universities going to look like in the future becomes an equally important part of the conversation. I think somebody else highlighted um, the student experience and graduate attributes and what, what is that student experience going to look like? Um, what, is, um, what are the graduate attributes of university students going to, to look like as we go about prepa preparing the future? A few other things that I'd, I'd like to see come out of this discussion is for us to talk about the importance of innovation at universities, to talk about incubators at universities, to talk about internships, and how do we bring, when we talk about the entrepreneurial universities, how do we bring industry closer to universities? We need to look at the, the triple helix, the role that corporates, governments, and academia plays in terms of challenging some of the, the challenges that we, that we face. Um, those are some of the things that I'd like to highlight as we as as we um, as we go about this discussion this evening. I also think we need to to touch on sustainability of of higher education. Um, we need to look at accessibility of higher education, and we need to also look at um, affordability of higher education. 
And I really hope that the conversations are going to evolve this evening so that we can bring about some of those important components um, as the discussion goes on. Tulani, I'm going to stop now. I just wanted to highlight some of the things that I'd like to bring to the fore and some of the, the, the topics that I, I would like, uh, particularly around entrepreneurship development in higher education and why that is so important and why I believe so many students have the opportunities to become, um, to become entrepreneurs in our country today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Sh Sh uh, Shaleen. That's uh, that's insightful. Um, I, I do I do have to to agree. Like I think you had warned me that you can talk for days. So uh, thanks for for that. Um, uh, it's it's I think it's interesting when you say every student should have an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, and that should be ingrained across every discipline. Um, I think that's a very interesting concept because a lot of us, a lot of people see entrepreneurship as 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 something in its own box and maybe that's where we're getting it wrong in academia maybe that's what we need to be discussing um and and i think also yeah i think it's something maybe maybe nicola would want to talk on as well when you when as she does her opening remarks to say from the time she came into to the academic higher academic uh, space as a student to, 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 to the output. Expectation wise, where those met, um, does she feel um, they needs to be an evolution with the curriculum? Because ultimately the curriculum points you or points a society to, to where it needs, it needs to be. Um, so, so I think we're going to bring back Nicola. I'm, I'm hoping your, your connection is good. Nicola, are you are you there? Hey. Yes, I can you hear me. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um so okay. So um what I was trying to say early on is um, so I was I mostly talk from like personal experience because I come from um I feel like socioeconomic status is something that is very important to take into consideration when looking at um reimagining education and going into the workforce. Um, I myself personally come from low socioeconomic background and then I had access to a private um, university which created, um, which exposed me to a lot. And I feel like exposure is one thing that is extremely important. Um, knowing, moving from one side of the spectrum to another side I have, realize that a lot of people don't have the exposure to for example like i'm working for cornerstone institute right now so with that said if i wasn't at cornerstone i may have not had the opportunity to get to know the people i have and had the opportunities that i have received so i feel like it's important to um look at the 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 between the haves and the don't haves and I feel like the pandemic is one as as highlighted shit more like um being like I've completed my undergrad in, in but then also I, I'm not working in the field of psychology. I feel that there should also be an, there should be focus on explaining more what is it that um, you're moving into it's important to start not only like not just focusing on tertiary <laughs> education but focusing on primary and high schools as well or exposure in I'm struggling so yeah so I feel like we will be talking about um, the exposure the, 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 the um, more things in 
high school and schools in order to Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I can hear you. I think you have a really, really bad signal, though. Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm all the way on this side of the world. So I don't know why. Um, so I think my focus would be to look at having more exposure in schools where there is less um, resources where the because the government is not providing, I personally feel like the government's not providing enough resources for schools in low socioeconomic communities. And the pandemic has also shown this, um, where um, people in private schools and model C schools are able to go back to school at the moment where there's a struggle in government schools. And these things, I feel it's, it's, it's a ripple effect so how it affects you from primary school to high school it will affect your ability to also get into tertiary education and move forward from that and also the level of education because i also when i went to a private university i i felt out of place because i could see the difference between um the knowledge that i had like just also general knowledge and the way I spoke and articulate myself and all of these things and in comparison to others. Um, so I think it's important to the level of education also to be looked at and focused on in order to develop to develop our education and push it forward, especially moving from now that we have to work remotely, a lot of people don't have the access to work remotely or the, the home environments are not conducive for learning so um yeah there should be a focus on the inequality the the difference the scale how it's tilted because there's a lot of like it's okay to say we can go back to school and all of these things and trying to push our society forward but there should be a conversation around why is certain things not happening and yeah thanks 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 nicola i think i think you bring you bring to the table a, a very interesting point if i if i heard you correctly the the issue firstly of inequality in education okay. and uh, inequality in terms of just uh, going forward, uh, the status quo, if I should call it that, because while everything is being done to go forward, uh, it means the haves and have nots issues has not been addressed. So, so yeah. ultimately, it, it means that while we say everything's being done correctly, the have nots then lag behind. So, yeah. So in developing in developing a, a workforce or in developing students, it means we are then developing a particular type of students, student, which then becomes people who've always been above the, the breadline, if, if I may, if I may put it that way. Um I'm 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 really really intrigued uh, or uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a question I should I should pose to 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 um, um, You know, uh, my 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 mind, to be honest, is is in two places. I, I was, um, I'm, I'm I'm very, I'm very amazed at, at the at the need for an entrepreneurial mindset, an entrepreneurial revolution. Um, I think there was a, 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 an interesting comment I saw on Facebook where uh, Cornelius, uh, I think Cornelius Janssen, uh, likened it to an entrepreneurial awakening. So in, in terms of that, I think that's something that obviously, um, Shalene, you'll, you'll help speak to in terms of, the, uh, you know, to say, how do we do that? Because yes, we want it, but how do we do that? Uh, but but Ngondi said, I just want want to bring it back to you to say, how then do we develop um, um, 
the, the skills you are talking about, especially with the dynamics we have right now of the haves and have nots. Because while we are back to your analogy of being on, you know, uh, a great admiral, it, it means if, if we take the perspectives that Nicola is bringing on board, ultimately it means the greatest admiral will only come from a particular social group. So I have a number of thoughts around this. So let me try. Um, let me try and take on a break. I think one of the things that we see is that the skill aspect to the graduate that they are able to do from this, but also this aspect that Nicola was alluding to about, um, you know, if I paraphrase and maybe expand her point, things like confidence, not feeling out of place being in a private institution and you know, feeling as though you have the general knowledge and the ability to articulate yourself, come to the fore, lead, to be able to do a number of the things that we now recognize are the things that are most useful in the world of work. Those are the things that I think that we have a huge opportunity to try and instill. So there are going to be two aspects and I imagine that Charlene will speak quite a bit about the skill aspect of entrepreneurship and um, whether she does or doesn't, there's this, 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 this um, aspect of the person that is required to be able to take the necessary ownership in order to be able to play certain roles in the world of work today. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to make sure that we're providing the type of knowledge that is able to, trans to transform um, the next generation of young Nicholas who are coming from environments where they might feel slightly shy and be able to transform them into the people that can take ownership and come to the fore and deliver all of the potential and the ideas and the expertise that they have. So I think that's the one aspect. And I think that maybe I want to underscore this, underscore this aspect in the following way. Uh, there's an ancient Greek idea, um, and it's an idea that I'm sure a BA in psychology will be aware of called eudaimonia. It's this idea that there is this um, life is can be roughly separated into two. One is called techni, where we get our root word for technical, and the other one is sophia, you know what I mean? So where we get philosophy. And it used to be that when people used to learn in that environment, I just pick on that one because it's an easy example, is that there would be an endowment of technical ability. So you're a shipbuilder or you are a merchant or you are a cloth whatever it is that you're doing to be technically proficient to be able to add value to society and now here is philosophy which teaches you how to interact with other people and also how you can further a, a great society now when we talk about digitization one of the things that is threatened is that a lot of the technical skills that we have are being surrendered more and more to machines which means the types of skills that we're looking for and people coming out of higher education institutions right now are the types of people that are able to take the ownership, are able to speak to other people, are able to be coordinated, are able to collaborate across many cultures, dimensions, and um, disciplines. And I think that those are the things that we need to look at in our new package of education. Don't just send someone out with some technical ability, also send them out with the knowledge that allows them to become this person that is philosophically able to take the lead to you know, present their potential to the world. I think that's one idea that we need to. Um, so I think that would be the, the, I think the major point that we could do here. I know that you... Okay. Um, I, I hear you. Just, just I, I want to throw this to, to Shaleen, just to say, um, you mentioned the new, the new package of education. And I believe in your books, that new package means an ma entrepreneurial mindset across various um, uh, spaces. How can that be done? Can that be done? Is that being done? Tulani, can you just repeat the question across? I've just got you. I lost you there. Oh, OK. So, um, so I'm going to alluded to uh, a new package of education, right? And if, if I put it in your space, you will put it to be an entrepreneurial mindset across various disciplines, right? So my question is, can that be, can that be done? Is that being done? 
Okay, so I want to talk about what entrepreneurial mindset is firstly, and I, I think we, we've heard one or two of the panelists talk about the, the fact that students they lack the confidence. Um, we, we come from a, from a society in our country where if you're an entrepreneur, it's not seen as a, as a career. Entrepreneurship is a career. That's, that's one of the things that you want to change in, in the way people think about entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship is not something that you do when you can't get a job. Um, entrepreneurship is, is um, something that sometimes our students, um, our family members think that we're lazy if we become entrepreneurs because it's not considered to be a real job. So one of the things that, 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 we need to, to, that I want to say and I want to make a statement is that entrepreneurship is a career. The second thing is that we are not taught, we are not given the space to be able to fail in the South African context. If you, are, if you fail, it's not seen as an important part of learning and development. You're seen as a failure. People don't want to support you um, financially. It's difficult to get um, financial institutions to back you. And so how do we begin to change the mindset that failure is an important part of development? Now, I quickly want to just say that when I talk about the entrepreneurial mindset, it, it's twofold. It's the way you think and it's the way you act. And it also has a lot to do with agency then and how you see yourself as an individual and what you believe you can or can't do. And that's a very, very important part of the entrepreneurial mindset. So an entrepreneurial mindset talks to competencies like um, opportunity recognition, opportunity um, assessment, um, risk taking, um, guerrilla skills, resource leveraging. And those kinds of skills are the kinds of skills that you will need in any in, in, in any sector. You don't only need those skills, you need those skills more than ever if you become an entrepreneur, but those are skills that you can use um, to in, in corporate, in government. You can use it in terms of the crises that COVID-19 has again shown us in terms of, of um, food insecurity challenges, the challenges in terms of whether schools must open or reopen. Um, you know, that kind of mindset is able to help you to need to navigate navigate um, many different areas so to go back to how do we do that at uwc or you know you spoke about how do we do that across i just want to use one example um if you look at the dentistry faculty at uwc you may know that um that we're the only university in the western cape that has a dentistry faculty and we graduate 90 dentists a year um for many years, uh, the, the practice management module, as it's called, is taught in the fifth year, which is your final year, in the second semester. It is, a um, I forget how many hours now, I think it's 50 hours, I speak under correction, but a limited amount of hours where students are engaging, clinical students are engaging for the first time in terms of, of, of practice management. We're looking at a new approach. We've been involved in that practice management module and we've looked at presenting it in various ways. And um, for the past two years, we've used design thinking methodology. Um, but it's also about how do you give students, clinical students who go on to become great clinicians, but many of those dentistry students are not going to find jobs. They actually have to go and open up their own private practice. How are you equipping those students to be able to actually um, open a private practice if, you, if you're only teaching them practice management in their final year um, for X amount of hours in the second semester when the focus of that student is, is looking at graduating and completing a year. So how do we start to look at integrating entrepreneurship into mainstream programs and not only seeing entrepreneurship development happening as co-curricular activities at universities. Yes, there's lots of merit to co-curricular um, activities. Many great entrepreneurs who um, became entrepreneurs through universities are successful because of those co-curricular programs. But I think there's a, a real need to look at um, entrepreneurship in academic spaces. And how do we start integrating that into various into various programs. We're also quite active in the in the pharmacy faculty at our university with a fifth year elective where we um, introducing fifth year, final year, fourth year pharmacy students to um, 
also using design thinking methodology. And I remember three years ago when we, we started this program, chatting to some of the senior lecturers in the department. And, and even I thought, how are we going to teach or what do you teach when you um, pharmacy students in terms of, of entrepreneurship? Um, how do you get that mindset of a pharmacy student um, to shift and to change? And when you started, when we started with clinical students about um, getting students to think about through a design thinking methodology process, talking about empathy and coming up with various ideas, it was such a fascinating experience. So I do believe, and I'm going to I'm stop here now to give other people an opportunity to talk as well, but I do believe that there's great opportunity for us um, as universities to look at how do we do that? How do we um, position ourselves? And there is a, a national platform called Entrepreneurship Development in Higher Education, where they look at um, entrepreneurship in three different areas. The one is student entrepreneurship, which is your co-curricular space. The other one is um, academia entrepreneurship, academic entrepreneurship, which is a bit about what I was uh, talking about now. And then the entrepreneurial university um, as well. So I think there's, there's a great opportunity when we reimagine education to look at the importance and the relevance of developing an entrepreneurial mindset about giving students competency-based learning modules where they learn competencies that will enable them to equip the challenges that the world of work will provide in the 21st century. Thanks to learning. Shalene, just before you go, maybe in a, in two sentences, something short, what, what do you think academia is or institutions are, are willing to reimagine a new educational space uh, because of the perceived rigidity of, of these institutions. So what you're talking is great, but how easy will it be to implement? So I like to use this example. I mean, I think, yes, uh, my, my answer would be, I think there's a willingness. I think that there's a lot happening. Um, but again, I found that I've been at a university and I've been in academia for seven years. I've worked in corporate and I've worked in government. And when I got to university, it was a very, I thought it would be an easier journey, an easier way um, into, uh, I, I just had very different th thoughts about universities. And so one of the things that I've learned personally is that a lot of the work that, that we do in entrepreneurship development is very, is closely linked to personality. It's closely linked to whether um, um, there's, a, there's this empathy, this understanding, um, for the for, for what you're trying to do in entrepreneurship development in higher education. I, I don't think it's a space that everybody understands and that everybody um, appreciates, and there are various reasons for that. But I think there is a willingness. Um, it's evident in the work that we're doing across the 26 universities. There are amazing people and amazing champions. And I want to answer you by using an example. So often when you talk to academics and you talk about changing curriculum, there's a panic. It's not an easy process. I mean, I really believe that um, universities need um, to also be more entrepreneurial. And that's part of what the entrepreneurial university is all about, about how we go about doing things and how we start changing this, all these committees that need to make decisions and processes and how that isn't an enabling environment. But I'll give you an example of the dentistry faculty. And we also um, do a, a project a program in the nanoscience, which is a, um, a master's program at UWC, where we didn't change the curriculum. We looked at the learning outcomes. And there are many ways to, 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 to obtain the out, those learning outcomes. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an open-ended, it's a creative space where you can really be, be creative about doing that. So when we looked at dentistry and we looked at the, the learning outcomes of the private practice module, you needed to be able to, to show that students understood the finance components of a private practice management. You needed to showcase that students um, understood the importance of, of basically setting up a business. And there are many, many ways that you can do that. So, so I'd like to challenge um, you know, anybody who's listening and saying that the current scenario that we're facing in terms of COVID-19 is that the way higher education has been responding, we've been res we've been responding to a to a state of emergency. We've been responding because we don't have an opportunity, and we shouldn't allow ourselves 
every time when we get into this position to respond just in terms of responding to an emergency, there's a space and an opportunity for us to be innovative about how we do that. And a simple thing as looking at the learning outcomes and looking at alternative, creative, innovative ways to meet that, whether it be in a blended learning space, um, you know, whether it be in an online space, whether it be through design thinking methodology, there's just so many other processes that you can introduce um, in, into academia. And it's, it's a wonderful space to work with when you have willing participants, um, willing faculty that can understand and appreciate that. Thanks, Shaleen. Thank, thank you for that. Um, that being said, just uh, is, uh, is, is, Lance still, is Lance still with us? Lance, you, yes, you, sit, I am. <laughs> you sit on various committees um, that, uh, that interact with, with faculty councils uh, and uh, you represent students and, um, and you've obviously, uh, I chatted to, with you, uh, I think last week, or, and we talked about some of the interactions you've had with, with a number of student bodies across South Africa. How important is it mm -hmm. for students to drive this process? Can they drive this process? This is taking into account that we're coming out of youth month and, and the youth have been, they, they should play an integral part in, in, in changes and driving processes, but I'm seeing less and less of, of the youth in, in these spaces. Lance, can you can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Sorry, my connection just cut there for a bit. Okay. So simple in just putting it. Short, um, it, I think I. Hmm? Do we have a loop there? Um, Um, could you please um, um, ask your, your question again? Okay, so how important is it for, for, for the youth, considering the spaces you are in, to drive the processes, some of the processes that uh, even Shalene was talking about with regards to the changes needed in the spaces? And can it be done um, in an amicable way, if, if I can use that, taking into consideration some of the uh, hashtags for uh, movements that we've had in the past? Um, can students drive that successfully? Um, is I think that it's definitely important. I think that it's important for students to, to um, or for the youth rather to to, 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 to to lead these conversations, and and I think on. A, uh, on a big scale, um, that is happening. We have students that are leading um, these kinds of conversations, but we have a very big enemy, and that enemy is <laughs> bureaucracy. Um, uh, as a as a short response to your question, but additionally, I do think that um, part of 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 what will make this you know this change or this this big innovative or this 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 innovation uh possible is um by uh, addressing um the soft i call it soft skills the soft skills shortage that we have amongst uh students particularly who 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 are in 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 hard skills discipline i was i was listening to to what um charlene was saying had I think when everything um the debate that 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 we had was that um students in the hard skills disciplines you know students in the, the stem disciplines science technology engineering and maths disciplines you see how um 
a, a curriculum transformation needs to take place in, in, in those degrees so that those students are equipped on how to engage or how to, how to engage in, 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 in critical discourse. Um, 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 how I see with how uh, some of these students or my peers, how they interact in, in, in social spaces. And you can see that, that, that um, what is lacking there is, is, is the ability to, to, to critically dissect or critically, you know, uh, discuss um, um, matters. I think one of a, a simple way to do this is, you know, um, allowing these students to do compulsory courses in the humanities or allowing these students to do service courses um, across faculties with they'll develop a, a, how um, Um, we seem to have lost, we seem to have lost Lance there. Um, sorry about that. Um, interesting enough, um, I think one of the, and I've been hearing this a lot, the, the issue of soft skills, um, um, emotional intelligence, EQ, um, and, and is there a link? Is Mkondi here? I'd, I'd like to maybe throw this question to him to say, is that you've having worked in in the corporate space, especially uh, with the companies you've worked with at, at that executive level? Is there a way that we can drive the link between corporates, government, and academic institutions to link soft skills at an earlier stage in in academia? Because for me, I believe we're, and, and I think you've said it before that it's being concentrated at a, at a at an executive level, rather than bringing it right through from from early academic spaces, which is what uh, Lance was talking about. So, so I think there's two. I think there's two ways that we can do that. So I think it's a big mystery for me, as somebody who's in business, to hear about the distance that academia and business always have. I hear on a, on a radio show, for example, a CEO who will go on to radio and lament lack of skills um, to drive his business. And also I hear somebody from the university is going, well, curricula should evolve and they should change. Um, and it's been a mystery to me as to why it is that in the middle of a semester break, why the dean, the professor, the academic lead of that place doesn't take 30 of you know, the closest kids and they are in an, 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 a corporate environment where they can actually see in real time what are the actual things that need to happen. Um, a friend of mine likes saying this a lot. He says, if I gave you a thousand page manual to read about swimming and um, I gave it to you and you read all of it, it doesn't mean that I can throw you off the boat in the middle of the ocean and you'll be able to swim. So there are certain things that are just very difficult to learn if they're not embodied in action. And many of the things that we're referring to as soft skills and additional skills and part of the entrepreneurial mindset that Chalina was talking about, which is required, those are no longer soft. They're no longer additional. They're no longer um, ancillary or secondary. Those are the skills for right now. So one of the things that I think is important is that we've got to make sure that we can actually just get beyond speaking about the transformations that are required and drag these two worlds together and actually get them to collide. When those two worlds collide, two things are going to happen. The first is the students themselves who are learning, who are now spending a semester or whatever it is in a corporate environment will start to understand the relevance of the things that they're being taught. There's a mismatch in academia somewhat in the sense that sometimes there are tools that are given but why those tools are necessary only becomes evident to the student much later on. Whereas if
you give the person the problem first, they then realize that the skills that I'm getting, um, those skills are why I need this particular tool to be able to get there. So it, we should be able to normalize things like um, when somebody comes out as a graduate, they should be able to interact with the CEO. Um, now, let's assume that, you know, you've got, I don't know, a, a BCom degree and you, you know, um, you are type of thinking is not something that graduates get a chance to, A, understand as the requirement. That's the requirement because otherwise why in this world work? But secondly, how can they think through these types of things? So um, there are many things that new graduates have to offer. The universities are nearly as responsive enough. Um, it's just weird to me. If, if, you have, if you have CEOs who are saying I've got vacancies, but I don't have the people to fill them, um, it would possibly be better if the, the major corporates actually pay the universities because they would have a very quick and frank conversation that says, listen, I'm not willing to pay for these graduates because they don't solve my problem. The intermediary of having the student pay is kind of making that brutal feedback um, lag for far too long because you've got this intermediary who's a student who is paying for this education against the hope that they will be acceptable to their employer. So that's something that is unfortunate. But what we need to do is we need to make sure that we can drag universities and business and make them collide and make sure that we don't go three years without at least six months in the world of work where there is this you know, embodied um, experience of what it is that I'm learning. You know, So people must swim. People must jump into the water and they must swim before they are told that they're a graduate, that they are ready for the world of work. Just reading the manual will not be enough. I think the second thing is we can't have the situation where we have business on the side and academia on the side talking about the incongruency, the incompatibility, the misalignment in different places. Those need to just collide and transformation of curricula can't be the thing that takes five years or 10 years. If we can't entrust a doctor, a PhD, if we can't entrust you know, teams of postgraduates working together to rapidly iterate um, um, curricula in real time in the same year, then I think we're in a much bigger problem about reimagining education than we think. We've got, to be the, we've got to be in the place where if you are a doctor of a specific place and somebody has a need in a corporate space, those two things cannot take years to come together. The reality of business is that this needs to be solved in three to six months. And I think that that's one of the um, um, impasses that we've just got to get over as quickly as possible. And there's nothing better in this place than just jumping in the water and swimming. Theorize about it, um, thinking about it, planning it is not going to be as effective as starting that first step. But the time for that is now. It can't be in the future. Shalene, just to, to comment on, on some of, of the comments you, you brought through in that. Thanks, Tulani. So I think it's important that we look at the graduate attributes. Um, the graduate attributes become very important when we're looking at what are the kinds of graduates that we, we want to put out there in the world of work. Um, I also think that things like critical skills and essential skills then become a very relevant part of the conversation. So if you look at how the world of work has changed, what are the kinds of graduates that, that we want to then place in the world of work? I know at our university, things like critical skills and an entrepreneurial spirit um, uh, is, is quite, quite an important part of the, of the um, attributes of a graduate. And so we need to really embrace what are the kinds of graduates that we want to put out there? I can't agree more with reference. I think I've made a comment around the triple helix and the importance of universities collaborating with business. I can't elaborate more the, the, the importance of, of universities um, collaborating with uh, business. We have an incubator, which is the first of its kind at our university, um, a retail incubator where we partnered with WSA. And... Um, just the relationship that the university has had with WSA and the opportunity for the students 
which goes to um, creating opportunities for students to work during back time, um, creating opportunities for internships, creating opportunities for experiential learning. Those are things that are invaluable. It narrows the gap between um, university and the world of work and it exposes our students to so many valuable um, life lessons that I really believe you, you can't go without if you don't need, you, 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 you actually can't enter into the space if you haven't had those experiences as smoothly as you would um, if, you, if you've been involved in an internship pro program. So I think people who work um, in students, uh, with students, who work in centers for entrepreneurship and innovation, where you bring on partners, where collaboration becomes an important part. Where you can get those opportunities for your students, where you can get internships. We don't want partners who only come on board and invest financially. Yes, that's great. We all need money. But I think there's a lot of value to developing those essential skills and those critical skills that our students need. Um, I just wanted to highlight that point about the importance of finding those partners and how experiential learning then becomes an easier um, 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 part of the of, of, of the puzzle and, and why collaboration is a vital part of this puzzle that we need to embrace. Because if we're not going to collaborate, when, if we're not going to find like-minded partnerships, we can sit and try and reimagine the space over and over again, but we need people with different skills. Um, that, can, that we can collaborate with that, that will allow us to, to understand the importance um, of, of partnerships like that. Thank you, Tulani. Thanks, Jeline. I have to say, I really have to commend you on the work you've done with uh, in terms of uh, the Way SA um, incubator. I remember talking to you uh, when it was still a, a concept and two years down the line, it's, it's come alive. So I really have to commend you on that. I, I have a very interesting uh, thought though, uh, like I said, it's, it's been bugging me for a while. As we talk about the future of work and, 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 and we're making these plans uh, for equipping young graduates, having the right graduates attribute, should we also be addressing the issue of the risks and consequences for those already in the workspace? And, and I'd like to pose this question to both you and Mkondis, because I think you're, you're best positioned, both positioned to, 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 to maybe give a brief snippet of, of your thought on that. Can you ask the question again, Tulani? Um, so so as, as, we, as, we, as we reimagine the education uh, space uh, in terms of graduate attributes, uh, how we equip uh, students to exit into the, into the work world, um, we're not really talking about the consequences and risks of this. Um, and in, in, in that sense, the consequences and risks, of those already in the workspace. How can that be mitigated or your thoughts on it? So, so I mean, I can, I can give you a perspective on that. I think um, I've seen that even in the comments, there's a lot of conversation around this idea of having to rebrand these additional skills that we're talking about as essential skills, all right? And we've, we've spoken about the fact that technical skills alone are not going to cover the working environment right now. I'm really going to try and put things starkly. Um, if I see two CA in my line of work and where I operate, you can get a CA that comes out of... Um, um, you know, a university and maybe it's in the first three years of their work, and they could be paid, you know, handsomely, say seven to nine hundred thousand rand a year, which is a decent living. But the difference between that and somebody who earns five million rand a year has got two, two, two differences. The ability for one to have let's the other one to have those are really the two things that drive um, earning potential when it gets to. Um, you know, a graduate, all right. So when I see someone who has got, you know, an enormous, it's generally are good at two things: Dina's complexity and really being good at handling conflict. Now, if I look at those two things, those things for the people in the world of work has kind of been picked up from an experiential point of view. So our postgraduate um, regime at the moment kind of goes something like this: get them. 
um, an undergraduate degree, perhaps even an honors or whatever it might be, go spend 10 years in the world of work. And then thereafter you can get, you know, an MBA or, you know, an advanced management program of some kind. Now, what that does is that it does alive and it makes people alive to what the skills are that are required while they are working that informs everyone in the world of work. The trouble I have with that, with that, with that idea is that it's not always possible, or not always conducive for everybody to jump back into the world of academia. You know what I mean? I've got a two-year-old. I'm recently married. I've taken over a new division, and I also need to do an MBA. That that level of difficulty might not be the best way to be able to address the people who are already in the world of work. And I kind of waiting for five or 10 years of managerial experience before we start getting people into, you know, kind of postgraduate programs is how can we do that in a bite-sized manner? You know what I mean? Much more often. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, professions, for example, like medical profession that keep CPU points, for example, you know, so continuous professional development um, and that type of idea. It's an idea that I think is um, one that we might try to explore in more than just the medical profession. Because I think what that does is that it breaks down um, the professional development, the continuous professional development in bite-sized chunks that more people who are already in the world of work might be able to fit in, as opposed to the, the, the kind of default system we have at this point in time. Shaleen, your thoughts on that? Uh... Uh, I just wanted to also be cognizant of the time. Um, I blinked twice and I see we have 10 minutes left and um, I'm, I'm really enjoying this, uh, this dialogue. But also, um, I'd like to pose another question to you, Shaleen, uh, that I got from, from an audience member. So I'll just read it out. Um, that says, can the falling, this is for you, Shaleen, can the falling forward experience not be applied at a secondary education level? How will we go about advocating for such an opportunity? Learning a language is easier before the age of six and seven. Is developing a mindset not more effective at younger levels? Absolutely, I agree with that. I mean, I, I've written an article recently and I've, I've mentioned this on a few platforms before. Um, we have said that... Um, it's almost too late to start talking about the development of an entrepreneurial mindset um, at university level. So it's imperative that we look at how do we integrate this? And so therefore I go back to um, a comment that I made in my opening statement. This, when you look at the, the, when we want to reimagine education in a way that we've talked or that we've been speaking about this evening, we need to look at the various role players we're talking about a culture of entrepreneurship that needs to be embedded in the South African society. And so there are, there are policies, there are role models that we need. It needs to be embedded in every aspect of the South African society and the South African fabric. And how we go about that um, becomes, I almost want to advocate for a collaborative approach in terms of how we go about engaging with various stakeholders in terms of how to do that. So. To answer the, 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 the question from um, the person in the audience, yes, I, I agree. We need to look at how we can do that much earlier on. It's almost too late when we get to university and we want to change mindset. And um, entrepreneurial mindset is part of a, a culture of a country. And we need to embed that in every aspect of our culture. I even want to, 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 to suggest that something like language and words and definition become something that we co-create and co-design and we own as a South African community. So that when we talk about entrepreneurship or we talk about innovation, it's a collective language that we understand and that we embrace and that 
this will facilitate in terms of policy development, in terms of role models, in terms of programs, whether it be entrepreneurship education, entrepreneurship training, whether it happen at school or at higher education. It's a long way off, but I think that there's a lot of um, good best practice out there, some of them both on critical and sound pedagogy, and it's about how do we collaborate more effectively for the benefit of, of all. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just going to pose another question to Lance uh, from the from the audience. I'm just uh, allocating, as I said, we're trying to be as interactive as possible. Um, thanks, Wendy, for that question. I believe that came from Wendy Aren Arense. Uh, thanks, Wendy, for that last question. Um, there's a uh, and and I'm, I'm hopefully hopefully not to get political about this, um, but at times there is no way of not getting political. Uh, let's just being cognizant of, of, of the time also, Lance. Um, the question from the audience was, during uh, your presentation, Lance posed the question of high price of education in South Africa. Uh, the question then becomes, is this deliberately expensive to further socially divide us? Um, I might need some help from my call. I might need, it's a very hard question, and I might need some help um, from my co-panelists in answering this question. Um, the short okay. answer to the question, I don't think that education is deliberately expensive uh, to, to further socially um, divide us. I do, however, think that mechanisms should be put in place to make education accessible to all. Yeah, I hope that answers the question in short. Nicola, your thoughts on this? I, I agree with Lance, I agree fully because I do feel because of, like I said in my opening statement, the, the difference in um, opportunity and exposure. Um, socioeconomics plays a big um, role in um, people having access to education. I'm not sure if, as well, like Florence, I'm not sure if it's deliberately done to further the divide but it is it is dividing there is a divide you can see that there is a difference between those who do have access to higher education and those who don't also you can see the difference between those who have access to better education and those who have access to like more like government schools and not as good of like opportunities as the other so, um Shaleen, you're you're in the works you're you're in academia uh your thoughts on this i know it's a bit controversial putting you on this one but why not Tulani, i must apologize i never heard um the question again um i have a lot of noise on my end so can you just ask me and then i'll respond please it's a yeah it's a very it's a hard question and it's a very it's it's it actually came from the pun from the from the uh, the audience, okay. um, Lance posed the question of the high price of education in South Africa. Is this deliberately expensive to further socially divide us? So it is a hard question. And I think to answer the question, I'd like to say that we cannot talk about reimagining education if we don't talk about um, the financial model of South African universities. Um, we, we need to talk about things like third stream income. We need to talk about um, um, some issues like government subsidies, how that's going to impact universities. We need to look at fee paying universities versus private universities. Um, and, and I know you said you, we don't want to get political, but if you just look at the four institutions in the Western Cape and you go about unpacking that in a political manner, there's a lot of answers and there's a lot that we can, can get to. But maybe what I'd like to say, and it's something that we must think about when we're wanting to reimagine education, and I'm not really answering you, Tulani, but the whole idea of an entrepreneurial university and the whole idea of what that means and looking at third stream income and looking at um, patents and innovations and commercialization, that becomes an important part of the conversation when we want to look at South African universities. Um, you know, when we had um, the fees must fall um, experience a few years ago, 
the 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 the, the questions and the uh, and and some of the concerns that I'm around accessibility and equality and affordability, um, all of those components become an important part of the conversation. But we really have to, to, to in, in my opinion, start with looking at that, that business model for South African universities. How do we generate income? Um, what does third stream income opportunities look like? And I think that would be an interesting topic for us to explore at an at another critical dialogue because um, there's quite a lot that can be said around that. It is. It's actually a very interesting topic on its on its own. Um, I'm I'm just taking a look at the time, and um, again, I'd like I'd like to just get your remarks, uh, your closing statements, considering the time that I have. I would ask that we keep it to under a minute. Um, <laughs> I see the shock on your face, Mkondis. Yes, under a minute for your, for your closing remarks. Um, Lance, you're up. Um, thank you so much. I saw one of the questions in the uh, that one of the audience members posed, and I formulated the response, which I'm sort of as my closing remark. Um, um, I think in my but to producing well-rounded graduates, but of course it starts at a grassroots level, which is you know the primary and the secondary um, education sector. Um, the question was along the lines of can reimagination be adapted to primary and secondary uh, levels, and I think that it can, and it starts with a, a benchmarking of, of you know the South African curriculum, uh, schools curriculum, um, with that of of countries perhaps in the global south that 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 have unlocked this level of imagination. Uh, I think we need to ask what is the curriculum and policy statement teaching our children uh, and does it meet that benchmark? And if no, I think that then we need to adapt the curriculum. We need to ask what we are teaching our children uh, and um, yeah, we need to ask what we are teaching our children and and I know that it's 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 it's, it's, it's in changing a curriculum, it, it might be difficult for teachers um, to adapt uh, to change, but I, I do think that it takes teachers to go be, uh, uh, above and beyond. And um, uh, I know teachers don't work under easy conditions, but I think that is what it takes um, from primary through to secondary through to tertiary level. Thanks. Thank, thanks. Thanks, Lance. Nicola, your, your one minute close, closing remarks. I think I think Nicholas' connection is down. Uh, Shalene, I'll hand that over to you. I will leave my closing um, comment. It's something that I've also written while I've been listening to everybody. And I want to say that um, I started talking about the revolution, and I'm going to end. I'm a I'm a student of the '80s, so I, I have to um, have to be revol revolutionary in terms of my thinking. But I want to say that an entrepreneurial revolution has important implications for South Africa. The problems across our great land are significant, but the opportunities are even greater. I'd like to close by saying that we have so many opportunities for all South Africans. And um, if we can develop an opportunity and a collaborative mindset in terms of how we tackle and how we channel and how we navigate the challenges that we face, um, I really believe that we can, we can, we can, we can come along. We can go a long way in terms of, of how we navigate the journey and the road ahead. Thanks, Lani. Thanks, Shalene. Thanks, Shalene. Um, Nkondisi, over to you. I think I'd like to end off in the same way that I started, and just point out the fact that my my starting point, I think, for the reimagining of education is to understand that we're all in the same Navy together. This is our Navy. It's for us to enjoy if we get right, but it's for us to endure if we get wrong. And right now, I think that too, the, 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 the distance is still too great in the sense that there is still um, business plus academia plus the student. When I can't find a graduate for my business, it hurts me. When that graduate can't add value to my business, it hurts their income opportunities. Collectively, we have got a number of societal bills that we need to pay from the taxation, for example, that could come from all the people working together, adding value, 
contributing to our, com to our common goals, of which subsidizing the cost of higher education might be one. So I think one of the things that would be useful is for us to know that we're in this together and that we should all you know, get into the same um, container and figure it out together to do so with less distance and to do so far quicker than we have been doing in the past. And so that's my final thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mkondisi. Um, as we close off, I just, I just want to say, um, um, I'd like to thank you guys, Mkondisi, Shaleen, Lance, Nicola, for, for taking part. Um, I appreci we appreciate your insights. They were deep and informative. Um, Nicola, are you, are you there? I never got closing insights, uh, closing remarks from you. You had frozen. Can I, can I take your, your one minute uh, closing remark? Uh, your mic is off. Hello? Your, your mic is off. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So I said, um, I think it's extremely important to like reinventing the um, educate the academia. It's very important, especially for this new generation and moving forward. Current situation, like having to work remotely and all of these things. I do think so it's important to um, talk about the gap um, and making it smaller and also for there to be a collaboration between, um, you know, the, like, um, entry university and high school and um, just incorporating um, things such as like we discussed, or that, that we discussed earlier on like um, soft skills and all these things that have to be incorporated into schools and like moving from there onto university. Um, yeah, I feel like if there seems to be, there should be like a discussion between these two um, groups and like making the, just the gap smaller and so that there can be a smooth transition from high school to university in order for it things to move more smoothly in that sense. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Tulani. Thanks, thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Lance. Uh, thanks, Mpontisi. Thanks, Shaleen. I think just, just from my take of this whole discussion is that um, as we reimagine education, as we reimagine the workforce, we this, this goes to speak that it's a broader discussion. Um, if we take cost of education, uh, the marginalized are, are affected as we go forward. If we, if we take the issue of the entrepreneurial mindset, where do we start off? Should we go right to, to primary school, which, which will be ideal? So I think there's a broader discussion in this discussion, but I'd like to take this time just to, to thank um, the audience uh, at home for, for tuning in with us to, to, to thank to thank you for your comments in driving this. Most importantly, I would like to, to thank the team, uh, the Cornerstone team that, that works behind the scene to, to, to make this go smoothly and, and keep us in line and in tune. Uh, thanks again. Um, uh, hope to see you uh, for our next installment of the Cornerstone Critical Dialogues. Uh, with that said, I would like to close the session. Shakira, thank you.